examining the next, the next year on the Israeli-Palestinian Fund. My name is Patrick Doherty, and it's the New American Foundation. My understanding is that this is actually a New America Foundation and the Century Foundation joint event. Um, Daniel Steele had it, and uh, we're excited to have you all with us today. Um, we're living in, as everyone knows, the, the, the midst of a Chinese curse, interesting times. Um, this particular uh, this particular event is supposed to be focusing on um, where we are now, what we can anticipate in the Israeli-Palestinian relationship between now and the inauguration, and then anticipating what may or may not be possible uh, with the new administration at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, I'm going to get straight to this. We've already kind of uh, lost 10 minutes. I'm not going to get wordy, but I want to introduce, there we go. I want to introduce um, uh, my colleagues here uh, on the dais. Uh, Mustafa Barbuti um, will be speaking first. Um, he's a medical doctor by trade. Um, he recently won 19.8% of the popular vote um, against Mahmoud Abbas in the presidential election in 2005. He was the, uh, he's a member of the Palestinian uh, Legislative Council, and he is uh, he was a, a minister, the minister of information in the Palestinian Authority of the United Government. Um, Daniel Levy, my colleague at the New America Foundation, uh, directs our Middle East uh, policy project, as well as the Prospects for Peace program at the Century Fund. Um, Daniel had an extraordinary career uh, uh, in the Israeli government, um, staying with the negotiations for a very long time, starting with Oslo B, um, being involved in the Geneva process uh, as a chief drafter, um, and then engaging on Jerusalem issues for the Barack government, uh, and is now with us after working with the International Crisis Group. Aaron David Miller served six secretaries of state since the late 1970s, um, completely focused on the Middle East process, um, and has a new book out, um, uh, The Much Too Promised Land. Um, and, and I encourage you all to get it. Uh, we don't have books out front for you to sell. I don't think that's allowed in this august building. Um, and he rose through the ranks to become a chief negotiator, uh, working uh, previously with, uh, uh, with Dennis Ross. And, and you know, I'm sure you know him better than I do. Um, so today the sequence is going to be Mustafa starting off talking about um, where we are on the Palestinian side, Daniel talking on the Jewish side, Aaron looking at what's realistic to expect from the American government. Um, and with that, I'm just going to jump right in. I know Mustafa has a presentation, but before we actually start, I can encourage, we have people to come in, because you're not going to really be able to see the presentation. If you're going to stand up, you might as well stand up on this side. Um, why don't we just click on, you can do it. <laughs> okay, and with that, we're going to start with uh, Dr. Mustafa Barbuti. Uh, please, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, I want to thank everybody for coming today to listen to us. I really appreciate that, and I want to thank the American Foundation, the New American Foundation, for organizing it, and uh, especially Danny, Danny Levy. Uh, I know that uh, since he's going to speak about this, that if we have the chance to go me and him to the next room, I probably will negotiate a solution in 10 minutes. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, we still don't have that power to live in the future. Uh, uh, and I want to start by saying that when an up, I, I, since we don't have much time, I will try to be very precise. Uh, when Annapolis process started, uh, many people have hope that there is a change and uh, there will be a real outcome. The basis of that hope was basically one thing, that the United States administration is involved. 
and uh, that was it. And uh, since there is a U.S. involvement, there would be serious change. Uh, I want to summarize to you what happened since Annapolis. Since Annapolis, uh, which of course, as you know, did not come up with a plan for a resolution, uh, failed even in its main document to mention the final status issues. They just hinted at them for distance. The only thing that uh, is specific that came out of Annapolis was the roadmap for uh, re-establishing re the roadmap one more time, and it was mentioned six times in the one piece of paper which came out of Annapolis. So even if we accept the roadmap as the basis of uh, the process, uh, what happened is really shocking, because the roadmap in its first uh, point speaks about Israel freezing settlements. And since Annapolis, the Israeli rate of expanding settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem has been 20 times more than any time before Annapolis. A shocking figure that came out only two days ago at the eve of the visit of Condoleezza Rice to the region, where it was said that Israel has just approved the building of 7,974 new units in East Jerusalem in comparison to 1,600 units that were built in four years between 2002 and 2006. So what they will build now in Jerusalem is almost six times more than what was built in four years. And that's why Israeli Peace Now movement came up with the uh, figure that uh, the rate at which settlements are expanding in the West Bank and East Jerusalem is uh, the highest in 10 years. Well, if that is happening while the peace process is going on and while Annapolis is going on, then what's the explanation? The other point that was mentioned in, uh, in the roadmap was the dismantling of the unauthorized settlements. I don't agree with this term, unauthorized, because I don't think Israel has the right to authorize any settlement to be written by international law. But even if we accept it, we had 105 settlement points, none of which have been removed. Uh, what does that mean to the peace process? Uh, I wanted to use the maps to show you uh, what would that mean. So this is the partition plan of 1947. And the two-state solution is not new. It was decided in 47 by UN, where Israel would have been established on 54% uh, and Palestine on 45% in the green area. Israel was established on 77%, what remained was West Bank Gaza Strip, which is only 23%. Palestinians in Israel accepted this painful compromise, which is to have a state in West Bank and Gaza on what can uh, be described as half of what was assigned to them by UN. So Palestinians think this is a great compromise. When Camp David took place, this is almost the map that was offered by Barak to President Arafat. And this is the map according to which I think Sharon and Ormat are working. So the evolution with building settlements, this is what's happening. A vanishing, a gradual vanishing of the Palestinian state. Uh, to the level that we are reaching a point now, a very crucial point, that with continuous settlement <coughs> expansion and building the world, the whole idea of two-state solution could simply vanish. And this is not accidental. This was done according to a plan. This is how the West Bank looked like in 1967. First settlements were built, all these red spots. Then checkpoints were established. And I put only half of them. If I put all the checkpoints, you will see a completely black map. And then the wall, this is the first stage of the wall, this is the second stage, and you will notice that in 85% of the cases, the wall is inside the West Bank, <coughs> not on the borders of Israel. And then practically, there is a plan to have an eastern wall to isolate the whole area of the Jordan Valley, and then this would be the outcome, which could be called a Palestinian state by name, but in reality, this is not a state. This is not coincidental. These are maps developed by Israel in 1967 by Gal Alon, who was then the foreign minister. And as you can see, everything was planned. First, you built in the Jordan Valley around Jerusalem, then in different parts. And whether we were in negotiations or not in negotiations, unfortunately, the plan continued. Uh, this is the map of Oslo, or what was implemented of Oslo. They say that the war was done for security reasons. 
But actually, if you apply the whole map to the whole of, to the map of Oslo, which existed in 96, 95, 94, before there was an intifada or suicide bombing or anything like that, you will see almost a complete fit of the world from the western side and from the eastern side. The main change is that there are plans to have these enclaves that would incorporate the utmost possible number of settlements to Israel. So if you want to keep all settlements, if you want to keep building settlements, if they continue to build the wall, that wall can be done by force, of course. But you can have all of that, but there will be no Palestinian state. That is the reality, because that would be the outcome. Not a contiguous state, not an entity that could survive, but something that looks like clusters of ghettos, pantostans, if you want. The only other map that looks like this was the map of pantostans in South Africa during the apartheid system. And then they had governments in pantostans. They even had a king in some pantostans. But it was not a real state. So my point is, since Annapolis, we have had growth of settlements that is destroying the basis of the possibility of peace based on two-state solution. Second point, number of attacks. Since Annapolis, there have been 2,254 Israeli attacks on Palestinian side. Of course, there were Palestinian also attacks from Gaza with, with missiles and so on. But the interesting thing here is that 1,039 of these attacks, almost 45%, took place in the West Bank, which is under Fatah control and Abbas control and Salam Fatah control, and where there are no missiles whatsoever, undermining not only the authority in total, but also undermining the whole concept of peace process, during which 4,479 4, Palestinians were killed, uh, including 66 children. That is a much higher figure than the total number of people killed during 2007, before Annapolis process. Uh, uh, since Annapolis, the number of attacks have increased by 300%. Settlement expansion we spoke about. Interestingly, the checkpoints. Mr. Blair was assigned to improve the freedom of movement and to reduce the blockage of Palestinian uh, freedom of uh, movement. Uh, at the time when uh, Mr. Blair was assigned and when we had Annapolis, we had 521 military checkpoints. Today we have 607. So thanks to his efforts, we had an increase by 886 uh, checkpoints uh, on the ground. Uh, I want just to show you something very quickly and then we move. Uh, the wall, because I think some of you have not seen the wall. The wall uh, is uh, described in American press as a fence. And a fence is something nice that exists between neighbors, you know. But in most of the cases, the wall is uh, like this, like this uh, huge cement structure that is eight meters high to nine meters, that is going to be three times the length and twice as high as the green wall used to be. This is a picture, you can see a woman on the top of her second floor building in, uh, in Bethlehem. And this is how close the wall is to her. I visited her in Christmas time, and she told me that she cannot go to the roof of her building anymore because now she needs a military permit to do so. This is the main wall between, uh, the main road between Jerusalem and Ramallah, which I used to use as a medical doctor to go to the hospital where I used to work, to the city where I was born in, and I can't go to now because we are, we are not allowed to go to Jerusalem. And the road doesn't exist because it is cut into two pieces by the wall. This is one example of so many villages and towns now in the West Bank which will be surrounded by the wall completely. This is the city of Calcilia, 46,000 people. The white line you see is the wall around it, leaving only one entry which is eight meters width, a road to the gate. And the gate has a key, and the soldiers have the key. And whenever they want, they can shut off the city. Similar thing is happening today to at least 10 different communities in Bethlehem and in Ramallah area. And there are about 800,000 people who are going to be stuck between the wall and the borders, and these people cannot leave unless they have parents, even if it's a woman who is pregnant and labor, or if it's somebody who wants to go to the hospital, or a person 
who wants to go to school. If they want to leave, they need permits. And in many of the 150 gates like this, to leave, they have to go through the specific time assigned by the army, which is from 7.40 to 8 a.m., from 2 to 2.15, and from 6.45 to 7 p.m. I'm not to go, going to show you more of that, but this is how school children do when they go to school. And uh, since we don't have much time to show more, I would like to come to the conclusions. The first conclusion, we cannot make peace and destroy its base at the same time. The issue here is not a fight between Palestinians and Israelis. In my opinion, this is a fight or a struggle between those who want to really, really want to end this conflict and this suffering and have a peaceful solution based on a minimum of justice on both sides. And those who are not letting it happen. So we cannot make peace and a state, a two-state solution, while the idea, the concept of a state is also being destroyed by these processes in front of the eyes of everybody. Second point, the United States, of course, can be biased to Israel as much as it wants, which is this. I mean, I think the speech of President Bush recently in the Knesset, uh, I think it was much more extreme than what 70% of the Knesset members would say. But the United States has every right to have this policy. It's, 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 it runs its own policy. But there is a major contradiction between the United States taking such extreme biased position to one side and demanding to, be, to hold the monopoly of the peace process at the same time. To be the sole mediator and at the same time be so biased to one side to the level that nothing can be done at least to stop the settlement expansion, which is undermining our future and their future, our future and Israel's future. Last point. I agree with those who say, I know this is a common criticism, but how can Israel make peace with Palestinians if Palestinians are divided and uh, Abbas is not in control of Gaza? Okay, fine. Then the only solution is to have Palestinians unified. And we had such an experience in the National Union government, which represented democratic choice, but at the same time had a very flexible program. And we had the impression when it was established that the United States would recognize such an entity. Unfortunately, this did not happen, and the unity government was isolated and it fell down. And now we have a big problem. The only solution to this, because my friends are getting nervous, I have spoken too much, the only solution to this, in my opinion, is democracy. Palestine represents a fantastic choice, option, opportunity for building a democratic structure, the first of its kind probably in the Arab world. And this opportunity should not, should not be lost. Maintaining the existing division will not lead to any change. And I believe that democracy is crucial not only for our future as Palestinians, but it is detrimental. It is so necessary as a precondition for having peaceful resolution. Because history has taught us that the only agreement that can last and endure is the one that is concluded between the monks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barcusi. Um, I think it's, it's important for us to really get that message out here when the, the headlines on Israel-Palestine are Secretary Rice's 21st trip to the region. Uh, Israelis negotiating with Syria some extent with, with, uh, through Egypt with Hamas, but that the situation on the ground is still very dire. I think it's very good for us to keep focusing on that. Um, we'll turn to Daniel Levy now, and we're very lucky to have him uh, while there's some, some uh, football game, soccer game, uh, <laughs> happening uh, while we speak. But Daniel, um, please give us your perspective on where we are, uh, what we can expect between now and the revolution, and uh, what kind of prospects Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. I, I, I also, in addition to thanking you all for, for joining us this lunchtime, would just like to thank my colleagues at the New American Century Foundation in particular, somebody who's helping us now, working with us, Rebecca Rabu Shadid, who's standing at the back there, some of you may know that, and Dana Millay, both sporting similar hands. Um, but Mustafa, you said if, if we went into the next door room, uh, it would take 10 minutes probably to thrash out a deal. 
I fully agree with you. I'm, I'm kind of looking over towards Aaron because Aaron will be very helpful in telling us what role Americans can play in terms of whether it could take less than 10 minutes, five minutes, or an infinity. And um, I'll just briefly give a plug, um, not only for Aaron's book, which I'll mention in, in a moment, but uh, on the 27th of this month, we're, we're hoping to do an event with Aaron to discuss the issues he raises in his book with, with, with several people uh, at the New America Foundation. I want to make a few comments. First of all, looking at it from here, and then looking at it from the region. And three things to say about looking at it from here. And my starting point would be, remember your ABC. And the ABC that I'm referring to, which people may have already forgotten, it's in dim and distant memory, was the anything but Clinton, which this administration made really its, its, its flag when it took office. Uh, many parts of that I, I, I disagree with, especially as they applied it to the Middle East and to disengaging from Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking. making. But I think there's a piece of ABC which it would be wise to remind the administration of today. Part of the ABC was the Clinton administration made an ill-prepared last minute dash for a comprehensive peace in the summer of 2000 with the Camp David II summit and what followed thereafter. And that's the piece that I think they should be reminded of today. I do not think that the conditions are conducive, and this is coming from someone who, who kind of, it would be difficult to claim is, is doing this in order to delay because I'm not really interested in a, in a two-state deal. But I think the conditions today are not conducive to reaching uh, what would be called the shelf agreement, to reaching an agreement on paper between now and the end of the year. And to the extent to which that is still part of the narrative um, of this administration, I, I, I think that, that is what should actually be shelved. Um, there are things that can be done, but I don't think we have an environment today in which that is doable or desirable. I, I think this administration, and, and, and I don't want to cover ground that Aaron might cover, um, can do a handover, can say we inherited a very bad situation, and, and they can give quite a compelling narrative, some of which I'll agree with, some of which I won't, that we're going to hand over a better situation, we've got ongoing negotiations, we've managed to um, begin to improve the daily situation on the ground. Not really, but that's what will be claimed. However, I think that the degree of legitimacy of the two main interlocutors on the Israeli and Palestinian sides dramatically weighs against them being the people to sign and sell a historical agreement. Perhaps unfortunately and unfairly, I don't think Israeli Prime Minister Olmert is politically resuscitatable. And I'll come on to that in a second. I think perhaps President Abbas could represent a broader, more legitimate Palestinian uh, national leadership, but not when, when there is such division. And um, Mustafa addressed that just before. So my second one would be what yes. Because I, th I think the challenge for the next six months becomes, for this administration at least, because there are things that I think need to be done but that they are not positioned or not willing to do. But in terms of where the administration is positioned and what it is willing to do, I think there are two challenges over the next six months. One, is there a way of locking in some of the content of what is being negotiated so that we don't start from scratch and so that there is a triple handover. A handover on the American side, so we, we don't have a repeat of what happened under President Clinton, where the President put out parameters in December of 2000 and then took them home with him. And we have to start from scratch. That was literally the position. These parameters are, their, their sell-by date is when I leave office. But also handovers on the Israeli and Palestinian side. And I would, in a way, put an emphasis here on the Israeli side. That we don't have to start from scratch. It's, it's interesting that one of the demands being made on Hamas is to respect previous agreements, where the Israeli leader of the opposition is saying explicitly that he would not respect any agreement reached by the current Prime Minister. Um, so the one thing is, are there elements of the content 
that we could somehow lock in. And the other thing is the day-to-day. To the extent to which, since Annapolis, there has been an American focus and the beginnings of a structure put in place to try to at least prevent further slippage. And, and they're not being tremendously successful so far, but I think the focus on this is nonetheless helpful. Can you lock in something that, 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 that means that the next administration will also have some kind of a mechanism for preventing further slippage? The three things I'd say about that are as follows. Number one, one would have to be realistic and somewhat modest in one's expectations. I think whatever there is on paper is not necessarily going to bind or guarantee that the next administrations, certainly not in the region, certainly not on the Israeli and Palestinian sides, um, will follow this. I think there is an option, which would be my second point, for the administration, for Secretary Rice, to put out parameters and say, here is our understanding of where the negotiations are at and where they might go forward from here. The caveat to that uh, is twofold. Number one, they would have to get it right. The content really matters. The content of the Clinton parameters, I think, got us a long way towards that. Not quite all the way. Um, and that was after having got the content pretty badly wrong uh, at Camp David. So the content matters, and I'm, I'm not sure whether I'd advocate it. And the second thing is it, it's only relevant if you've arranged in advance with the next administration that they will adopt whatever you're putting out there. In other words, if in the waning days of the Bush administration there is an Israel-Palestine-Annapolis -Palestine legacy speech, be damn sure that the incumbent is saying, yes, I will take this forward. In terms of the mechanisms for improvement on the day-to-day, -day, I don't think they've got it right yet. There are three generals on the ground, none of them are full-time. The one who should most be overseeing this, General Frazier, is also not full-time. And, and I just ask you, is given the success or lack of it that we're seeing, is it reasonable that th this is the Secretary of State's visit scheduled from her time as Secretary of State in the last three and a half years, in other words? 20 visits to Israel, four to China, four to the entire continent of Africa, and two to India. Double as many visits to Israel as to India, China, and all of Africa combined. And, and these are the results. To me, that says a kind of not spectacularly uh, efficacious investment of time and visits. And, and my last comment on the American side, what, what, what it says to me uh, is the most important conversation, perhaps, and I don't know whether this is realistic, between the next president and whoever is leader in Israel at the time, I think would be as follows. We'd like to see a peace process. Are you willing to walk down this path? If the answer's no, then I'll come on to that in a second. If it's yes, what are your parameters? And if those parameters are not realistic parameters, and we know today what the parameters of the two-state deal are, if those parameters are not realistic, then I think the American president has to take a position Well, we believe in two states and we believe in a peace process, but we also respect your democracy. We're not going to force you to go there. What we are going to do, that we're not going to have a sham peace process, where even though we know that your position is not a position that can get us to, a, to an acceptable solution, we'll still pretend and we'll have meetings and we'll see what we can do with it. I think the position has to be, we will then focus, Mr. Prime Minister, on keeping the two-state option alive. And that means saying it's all about settlements, it's all about not further eroding the situation in the territories, not further uh, allowing the great creation of an infrastructure uh, of occupation that not only creates a reality on the ground, but more importantly to me, creates a reality up here. For people lose hope, people lose belief, and that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because what's happened in the last few years has been the following, and I had this conversation as well when I was an Israeli official. Yes, we'd like to be doing more on settlements, we'd like to be doing more on freeing up the Palestinian economy and easing the freedom of movement, but right now we're in very tricky political negotiations on the final borders. What does it matter if we add a thousand units tomorrow? We're negotiating the final borders. And we're trying to keep our political coalition together, and you know Israeli coalition politics. 
how fragile and shaky it is. If you place too much emphasis on that, then we can't go forward with the negotiations. And the consequence, the outcome at least, the product has been neither a peace deal nor an ability to manage the situation on the ground, so constant erosion of the two-state solution. I think, by the way, if that's the approach, it will create a very interesting dynamic uh, on the Israeli side. And I really would say that, uh, um, that, that Aaron's book is full of, of, of phenomenal insights and, and, and is, is, to my mind, the most uh, interesting read on this. Quickly on what's going on over there, the Israeli internal situation. Like I say, it, it, may be, it may be that, that there's been no transgression, it may be that there's been uh, no transgression significantly different from his predecessors. Well, that makes a big difference when someone's singing, who was apparently involved in handing over cash envelopes. But fortunately or not, because I think he, I actually think those aren't Olmert's maps. That's one thing that is important for me to say. I think Olmert has a far more realistic take on what the territorial dispensation would need to be. Olmert is no longer a viable political actor to secure a peace deal. I'm not sure if that's the conclusion that Secretary Rice will come home with or not. He can't be your salesperson. He doesn't have the legitimacy. And I say this with a degree of, 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 of sadness. Um, his competitors within his own cabinet, within his own coalition, won't let him do it. Foreign Minister Livni has no interest in hanging in this. Defence Minister Barak, leader of the Labour Party, has no interest in handling in this, and that's before we even talk about the opposition. We might have a new Prime Minister in Israel before the end of this administration. I can't believe that that new Prime Minister would want to immediately sign a peace deal on the administration's timetable, kind of on day one. So I don't think you have a new Prime Minister for that. Um, I've mentioned the con... The, 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 the content of an agreement, that we have to get that right. The other thing, of course, is the context. And in terms of the context, I think there's been least attention paid to that. I won't go into it in detail. There's one thing I will mention in, 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 in passing. The context of the agreement is what is the environment, what are the conditions in Israel, on the Palestinian side, in the region. I don't think you can drive this home through exacerbating divisions in the Middle East, through making this about the good guys against the bad guys. I think one has to take a terribly cold-blooded, hard-headed, realistic approach. That certainly applies to division on the Palestinian side. The important content issue that's being dealt with now is the ceasefire. Is what's happening in Gaza, between Gaza and southern Israel. The situation for Israelis in the towns and communities bordering Gaza is intolerable. The situation for the Gazans, including the 1.4 million who are not Fulbright scholars, uh, is intolerable, and when we think about the seven, I think we have to think about the other 1.4 million. Um, if one could get a ceasefire, then I think that would be the most important thing for beginning to create a more conducive environment. Ceasefire means more than stopping fire. For the Israelis, it's going to be very important that there is a more effective effort to prevent weapons getting into Gaza. For the Palestinians, it means actually being able to breathe, opening up the economy, opening up the closures. Obviously, the Shalit issue comes into it. One final thing to say. I kind of think the word instrumentalist, or being instrumental, has to enter the Israeli-American relationship a bit more. And I say that in the following way. I think if I were being instrumental from the American side of this, I would say, this is really, and not just in, in visits, this is really too heavy a price that we're paying for slippage and for the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What it does to our image, what it does to our credibility as America, what it does to our ability to build and lead alliances, and perhaps most importantly, the gift that this gives to America's adversaries. All you have to do is wave the Palestinian flag and everyone, if you're anywhere in the Arab or Muslim world and everyone understands that America is the facilitator, is, is doing something wrong here. But from the Israeli side, let me just say, is my final sentence, why I think Israel needs to be more instrumental about this. And I'm very influenced by my colleagues at the New America Foundation. Harav Tana has a book, The Second World. Flip Leverett talks about the New Middle East. And he's talking about the Gulf. And Harav's talking about other emerging powers in the world, including some of them being Middle East and Arab powers. I, I think we are on an inevitable decline in American hegemony and power in the world. I think American policy will determine whether it's a steep decline or whether it's a more bumpy, gradual decline. And I'm not commenting on whether that's good or bad. I think it's a reality. 
as an Israeli, I'd say we have a fundamental interest in locking in permanent borders that are recognized by the entire region, while American power is still such that it can help us achieve that. And that's the kind of instrumentalism I'm talking about. Thank you. Daniel, thank you very much. Uh, you laid out a lot of issues that I know we're going to chew on, uh, but I will turn to Aaron. Um, and, um, you know, this, we've been talking about, so far we've kind of looked at where we are, where we're, um, what we're going to look at between now and the, um, uh, the inauguration fairly well. We've been very well. Um, I also want to look at, you know, I want you to look at all those three questions, but, but, but in particular look at the other kind of Israel policy issue out there. There are people who have a big article today saying that there's actually a real political consensus that it's, it's too late for sanctions to work on Iran. And that is part of this context that Daniel was talking about. We're not, we haven't talked about it yet. It's kind of the elephant in the room. If you can weave that in, that would be great. But give us the, 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 your broad perspective on all three and you can that Thank you very much. I'm sorry to have been late and stuff. It's very good to see you as usual. Daniel, it's also a pleasure. Patrick, thanks for that for overly generous introduction. I want to make six points. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about Iran, hopefully in the context of an American marriage. Um, I, um, I think the one key issue here is that we cannot afford any more illusions about the way the world is. So these comments are most are, are analytical with some detachment. I'm less interested in Israeli and Palestinian interests, frankly, and much more in, interested in American interests. Um, because the cost to America of failure in this enterprise, is, as well as the other three or four core interests that we have in this region are higher than ever. Uh, number one, uh, there is no conflict ending solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that is possible now. What I say by conflict, what I mean by conflict ending is there is no agreement that can adjudicate all claims and all irredenta and allow Israeli or Palestinian leaders to stand up and to say this conflict is approved. Uh, I'm not going to comment on whether or not though that is possible in the future. I don't know the answer to that question. I have a 28-year-old and a 26-year-old. Uh, I'm not going to mortgage their future by saying to you that such a conflict in the agreement is impossible. But nor am I, I, am I going to risk uh, saying that the gaps between Israelis and Palestinians are this close on the four core issues that drive their conflict, Jerusalem borders, refugees, and security. You have wide gaps, you have weak leaders, and you have a regional environment informed but not entirely dominated by Iran that makes peacemaking these days a very perilous enterprise. Number one. Number two, some piece of paper between now and the end of the year that advances these negotiations is in fact possible. 50-50 chance that Omer and Abbas, who have had scores of hours of conversation on the four core issues, will emerge. We don't know whether this channel is a discussion channel or a decision-making channel. We will only know that when in fact it is announced one morning when you wake up. Uh, a story in the Washington Post and the New York Times indicating that there has been an agreement on a piece of paper. This piece of paper will never be comprehensive given the constraints on, on the two sides and it is not implementable in the current environment. But we do need a piece of paper as long as it's not oversold or undersold. Um, Samuel Goldwyn, who made a lot of uh, movies, said that an oral agreement isn't worth the paper it's written on. And the fact is, um, we need a paper, a piece of paper with an organizing principle, at least to get started. I'm intrigued by Daniel's notion of locking in certain positions on key issues um, that would somehow be inherited by new Israelis, Palestinians, and Americans. But whatever agreement is reached on paper will not be comprehensive. Um, how, however much of an advance it, it, it is. Number three, ceasefire in Gaza will provide a welcome respite, but it is a road ultimately to nowhere. Because the fundamental question that needs to be addressed on the Palestinian side, and that Palestinian National Movement now 
is facing its worst crisis in 60 years, is whether or not the Palestinian Humpty Dumpty that has fallen off the wall and cracked can somehow be reassembled. Um, and the divisions and decentralization within this movement have many explanations and causes, and I'm not here to moralize or editorialize on what's up and what's down and who's right and who's wrong. But a unified Palestinian college is the only chance for any kind of agreement that can be implemented. Because no Palestinian leader can commit the Palestinian public to these conflict ending issues without authority, legitimacy, and consensus within Palestinian national circles. And no Israeli prime minister would ever make existential concessions to a partner that didn't control all of the guns. <coughs> Controlling all of the guns is an indicator of sophistication and credibility in any policy, whether it's the District of Columbia or the government of Sweden or Egypt. Unless you maintain a monopoly over the forces of violence within your society, you have zero credibility with your own constituents, and you will never have credibility with your neighbors. That monopoly over the forces of violence is gone. It no longer exists in a meaningful way. It will have to be reassembled. If any meaningful agreement is ever to be reached and implemented. Four, the Israeli-Syrian talks are a welcome development, but limited in what can be achieved now. Um, I would argue to you that the reason for them have more to do with local domestic politics, including the Prime Minister's need to determine or to show that he has other options, Bashar Assad's efforts to break out of an international isolation, um, and the need to maintain a certain measure of quiet on the northern border for the next four or five months. That will, all of those things may well in fact happen. But what will not happen is an, a, an agreement between Israel and Syria, simply because neither side is prepared to pay the price of what an agreement would cost. Neither side is prepared to pay the price right now of what an agreement would cost. And the one indispensable actor that will be necessary to marshal the support, deploy the forces, and ultimately broker the gaps that now exist between Israel and Syria Israel and Syria is not really interested in, in this right now. And I say that, again, with no editorial or pejorative meaning. It's just a reality. Five, the U.S. is like some modern-day Gulliver, wandering around in a region tied up in knots of its own making and as a consequence of knots manufactured out there. For eight years under Bill Clinton, we stumbled I would argue badly, even with the best of intentions about how to make peace, how to help make peace between Arabs and Israel, stumbled badly because there was real opportunity. For eight years under George W. Bush, we stumbled galactically about how to make war and protect American interests. If you cannot help to make peace in a credible way, and you cannot help to make war, when in fact your interests are threatened, what kind of great power are you really? And I ask this question with tremendous humility and modesty. Um, but the question needs to be asked, and the question needs to be answered, because the primary threat to America will not come from an, a, a, an emergent China with all of its economic power will not come from a Europe that is economically powerful and united. It will not come from a former Soviet Union seeking to regain its past glories as a great power. It will come, as it has come, from a dysfunctional, divided, conflict-ridden region in which America is now in an investment trap. We cannot fix this, and we cannot extricate ourselves from it. And finally, the next administration, 
to the next president, whoever is lucky enough and fortunate enough to win in November, um, I wouldn't be arrogant enough to suggest a policy for that next administration. I mean, failure should have a sobering impact on the way people conduct their personal and their professional lives. It really should. And I, my book quotes a line from Michael Jackson, who's not a preeminent philosopher. <laughs> but on this issue, it needs to be listened to. And in one of his better songs, Man in the Mirror, he or some lyricist argued that if you want to make a change, the place to start is by looking in the mirror. I would argue that's a very, very good piece of advice in your professional <laughs> So we need to look in a mirror before we go off um, on any more adventures in peacemaking or transformative diplomacy. Here's what I would consider several things. Number one, pay attention to the past. Um, AJP Taylor argued that um, the only lesson in history is that there are no lessons. Well, I think he's wrong. History is a cruel and unforgiving teacher if you don't pay attention to his lessons. And I agree 100% with Daniel that another Clinton-esque effort late in the day to bridge a gap between an Israeli and Palestinian leader on issues that cannot be bridged, which leads to failure, will be catastrophic. What I've discovered is that the most compelling ideology in life is not nationalism, it's not capitalism, and it's not even democracy. It's success. That's the most compelling ideology in life. Because success generates power in the constituents. America cannot afford another failure. So pay attention to the past, number two. Read the world the way it is, not the way you want it to be. Don't think you can do an Israeli-Palestinian agreement on the cheap. You can't. Both sides will have to get almost, almost 100% of what it is they want if they are to sell an agreement to their respective constituencies. There is a 100% minus X factor. It is the minus X that represents the flexibility that Israeli and Palestinian leaders have on borders, on Jerusalem, on refugees, and on security. It is not a large number. There is some flexibility, but not a lot. Three, make it a national priority. Larry Summers, who's no longer the president of Harvard, said some very controversial things, but one of the things he said that is right is that in the history of the world, he said nobody ever washed a rental car. And you don't wash a rental car because you care only about what you own. An American president has to own this and make it fundamentally clear to our enemies and our friends that he does own it. And finally, our relationship with the Israelis. And let me be very clear here. We have a special relationship with the state of Israel. We maintain that special relationship since Israel's independence. My judgment, having worked on these issues, observed them. It is a special relationship that is beyond question. No American president should ever be defensive or embarrassed about American commitment to Israel's security and well-being, it's a phony argument. It's an artificial argument that is constructed by certain groups who have organizational imperatives in certain constituencies, including the Jewish community, much of it, some of it, which I am a member, who somehow wants to believe that America is just waiting to somehow sacrifice and sell Israeli interests down the proverbial river, it is an illusion. The debate in this country between Israel's supporters and detractors is over. There is no more debate. It's over. And the pro-Israeli community, for good reasons, have won. Because it is in our interest to support states that share our values. But that special relationship for the last 16 years has become an exclusive relationship. It has stripped America of its flexibility. 
and its independence in terms of its tactics and decision making in how we conduct ourselves in the Arab-Israeli issue, among others. It has allowed us to say yes to too many bad Israeli ideas and to act accordingly, and we get ourselves into trouble when we do. And it has prevented us from speaking to a friend, which we will never abandon, in ways that friends should talk to friends when it comes to Israeli behavior in certain issues. Jewish community in this country suffers from what I call the cosmic oive, <laughs> which is the inability to distinguish between what is important and what is not important. And everything is elevated to a level of existential crisis and anxiety. I understand this. Jews worry for a living. Their history <laughs> compels them to worry for a living. But they have fundamentally and completely overdone it when it comes to the U.S.-Israeli relationship. The special relationship we need is the untold, best-kept secret about why we succeed in Arab-Israeli peacemaking. But the exclusive relationship, we don't need it. It hurts our interests at a critical time in this country. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Um, what I'm gonna do is just throw one question out from the floor hope that one of you asks Aaron a question about just what kind of time frame do we have before catastrophe hits, and how does that play out in the first term of the next administration, but you guys can ask that. Um, but for <laughs> uh, Dr. Barghouti, uh, Aaron talked about the, the Palestinian political need for an interlocutor, credible interlocutor on the Palestinian side. Can you tell us what you see is going to be a pathway to get there. Um, what hopes and fears do you have on that? And then what we're going to do, um, we're going to open up the questions, raise your hands, and I'll, I'll pick you up, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, and when you do ask a question, please identify yourself and your affiliation. Thank you. Dr. Barber, Well, I think uh, we agree. The three of us on uh, that specific issue that you cannot make a deal with part of the Palestinians or, or just a number of Palestinians that you simply like. Maybe because they say yes more frequently than others do. Uh, but that's not uh, a condition that is uh, sufficient to, to create a deal that can last. And uh, the solution was found. I think uh, we had a solution. And it is uh, absolutely and most unfortunate that that solution was killed. Uh, specifically by Israel, because uh, maybe that was part of the exaggeration on the side of the Israeli policy in this matter. But I think we had a fantastic opportunity when we had national unity government formed after democratic elections and after Hamas had experienced and exercised ruling alone for one year and it couldn't it failed. There was a golden opportunity for a national unity government that represented 96% of the Palestinian electorate democratically elected in, a, in an election that was described as the cleanest in the region and the most efficient ever. And unfortunately, that government was isolated, although I personally was, was promised by 11 different foreign ministers of Europe and by the Secretary Condoleezza Rice that if they would not recognize the national unity government, they would be able to deal with it. In the case of the United States, it would deal with national unity government, it would not deal with Hamas, but it would accept it as it accepts the national unity government in Lebanon at that time. And then everything changed. The program of that government was extremely flexible. I participated personally in drafting a big part of it. It said that the national unity government, including Hamas, was ready to honor international law, international humanitarian law, to honor existing agreements. It spoke about women's rights. It spoke about rights of people with disabilities. It had even a social component that was very rather, rather progressive for the context that we existed in. And we had a chance. The only way, uh, but all of this was destroyed. And the result is what? We have now separated West Bank and Gaza, a humanitarian disaster in Gaza, a terrible siege there, and a government Practically, let me be honest with you, two governments that are practically illegal because none of them have the authority from the Palestinian Legislative Council and both of them 
are consolidated in their hands all the authorities, legislative, judiciary, and executive. This cannot work. The only way out of this mess is to accept democracy as a right. I am sure my proposition would have been let's have national unity government for one year and they have elections again. And I am sure Hamas would not have that technology. But Fatah would not also get them. One of you, 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 you see, my, my point here is that please see the full picture. And the full picture of the Palestinian society is not just Hamas and Fatah, it's us too. We will be more important in the future. And I'm talking here about a rise of a very important movement that believes in non-violence as an approach, that believes in democracy as a way to go out, that believes in peace based on a real solution that also meets the interests of the Palestinian people and not a deal that just can be imposed on a Palestinian authority that is afraid to resist because it is corrupt or, 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 or does not have a possibility of representing its people properly. There is a chance, and the way to go there is by recreating, refining a way of ending this existing division. And we are trying to work on that as we did before and accept the basic principle of democracy, which means we go back to the people again and have elections again, and whatever people decide, we must accept. What about Israeli conditionality? There was, there was a US, my understanding, there was a conditionality placed on that unity government that were not yet. I think they were met, in the, and in my opinion, that is the difference. That the conditionality that was put by international community, and you cannot expect us to allow Israel to make condition, conditionality on us, and we cannot make conditionality on Israel. I don't know why this double standard should exist anyhow, just because we are weak. It doesn't work. But the international community has something that is basic, which is any Palestinian government must respect international law. This was there. Any Palestinian government must accept, honor, recognize existing agreements. It was there. A Palestinian government that is ready to accept uh, not only these principles, but also the basic norms of international relationships. But nobody can prevent Palestinians, like Israelis, from saying the Oslo Agreement was bad. You have people in the Israeli Knesset who are against the peace, the peace agreements. You cannot apply two different standards to two people. It has to be the same standard. And the thing that annoys me most, of course Israel enjoys tremendous support of the United States. We all know that. Of course, I do not see that the American administration would stop being biased to Israel. I, I know that very well. But the, that's the issue that really annoys me so much is why the Israelis? Why the Israelis? Not only miss the opportunity to speak about, but are doing something that will not make any Israeli proud, which is transforming occupation into something that cannot only be described except as an apartheid system. That is something all the support of the United States in the world will not be enough to prevent the drastic effect of the creation of such a situation on the Israeli society, on Israeli people, and on Israel as such. And if Israel is a democracy, I would have liked Israel in, to be encouraging the rise of democracy in Palestine. Because why not? Why not? We, if we are both democratic systems, and if we can accept a compromise, we can cooperate so much in front of a situation that is so complicated in the region. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Okay, we're not going to know. Right here in front. Yep. Uh, my name is Joseph Brown, I'm a member of the American Task Force in Palestine. And just a quick question. All three of you talked about, you know, bringing, or rather, reinstating some sort of new government, or at least consulting the divide between the, uh, the Palestinians. But even if we were to hold elections tomorrow, we can pretty much be sure that Hamas is going to play a part, maybe not a bigger, as big a part as they did in 2005, 2006, but certainly quite a substantial part. But the problem is the United States and Europe, what we've done is we've essentially made out that everyone who's in Hamas is a massive threat terrorist, they're all allowed to say much, you can't deal with them at all. So even if we allow them, to back, the question. even if we allow them, this is the question, even if we allow them back into the system, how can we justify dealing with them now that we've made out that they can't be dealt with. Because they will be back in the system if we hold elections tomorrow. Could you, I couldn't understand your accent, could you? I couldn't understand your accent. I mean, I, look, I, 
I don't think the issue is Europe, and I don't think it's America. I think it's whether or not a way can be found. It took, well, let me start this way. It took 20 years to get the secular manifestation of Palestinian nationalism represented by the PLO. And I realize that's an artificial distinction. Because our father thought that we're not secular, but they represented a status quo nationalistic impulse. It took 20 years to get the secular manifestation of Palestinian nationalism into a negotiating process, which failed. So I would only ask the question, how long would it take to get the religious manifestation of Palestinian nationalism into this process? I'm not arguing that it's a bad idea. I'm asking whether or not it's feasible. The critical determinant here is not Europe or America. The critical determinant is whether or not over time the Israelis and the Palestinian national movement in its full consensus will be able to find a way to negotiate with them. And whether or not the Palestinian national movement will find a way to advance a strategy that will bring it to the verge of accomplishing its objective. And I'll humor you here. Let's just assume the objective is a Palestinian state in the West Bank of Gaza with East Jerusalem as its capital and a solution to the refugee problem which preserves the moral, legitimate nature of Palestinian grievances with the demographic problems that the Israelis would confront. If that is in fact the objective, the question is whether or not the Palestinian national movement in all of its parts can find a way to create a strategy to achieve that goal. And that is less a concern, frankly, of America and Europe, and rests, I think, um, on an Israeli-Palestinian deal. And I don't know whether that's possible. I, I just want to comment on that, and it follows on from what Mustafa said. Look, in, in, the, in the quartet meeting before just over a year ago, before what happened in Gaza, before this division was, was set in, the Quartet came up with language that said, dealing with the Palestinian government, that reflects yes. that reflects the uh, Quartet principles. I, I don't go into Talmudic reflections on, uh, on the language used. But, and, and I'm sure that was what you felt, but this was a signal exactly. into, into what kind of a unity government would. So I think one could have looked as, as Mustafa says, one could have looked at that piece of paper and said, you're meeting a minimal bar. Maybe it's not a minimal bar for American aid, but it's a minimal bar for European aid in a certain way, for a certain kind of interaction. <coughs> the choice was not to, um, not to look at that half full cup and not to say you're, you're meeting a minimal bar. Look, undoubtedly, I mean, I, you, you refer to this, this, this in your book, Aaron, and by the way, the, the, the laugh out loud lines is like 5% of the laugh out loud lines in the book that we heard today, so there's, there's lots more of that in there. But do no harm. And here, I, I think in terms of the Palestinian national movement getting itself together again, I think it is incumbent at least on America and on the rest of the international community not to interpose itself in a way that what may in the way that makes what is anyway a difficult thing impossibly difficult. Um, because I, I think as Israel, we need a Palestinian, if, if you're an Israel that accepts your formula, Mustafa, and I, and I hate to tell you this, but you sound just like the Israeli Prime Minister in the following way. Um, <laughs> I hope not in every aspect. <laughs> no. Um, Ehud Omer, on his departure from the Annapolis Conference in November of 2007, said, if we do not get a two-state solution, Israel is finished. Israel will look like South Africa. And when that happens, the first people to abandon us will be the American Jewish community, because they won't be able to defend that. To the extent to which that is not verbatim, it is in no way twisting what the Prime Minister said. Um, if, indeed, and, and, and I think Israel is groping its way towards understanding what it needs to do, but probably needs an outside influence. If that's the case, we need a Palestinian national movement in order to be our interlocutor to finish this. And to the extent to which, I would argue, the next phase, and we've never discussed this, um, will also involve the Palestinian Arab community in Israel. 
increasingly being a crucible for defining Palestinian nationalism and Palestinian identity, just because I think the conditions in the territory is becoming so onerous, and the NGO community on the Palestinian Arab side in Israel being um, you know, so having, having built itself so effectively. That, that, so that's what I want to say on that. I just have to say one, one thing from, from your presentation, Aaron. And it's about the no one ever washing a rental car. I kind of think as far as the rest of the world sees it, you do own this. This isn't a rental car. And I think that's, that in many ways is the question for the US, whether it recognizes an ownership that in many ways exists. May I just add one, 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 one little line? Uh, about, uh, let's be direct to this question. Will Hamas accept the two-state solution? And a democracy based on uh, representation through elections in a proportional manner? Uh, I answer you from knowing them very well. Today, yes, they will. Is Hamas a unified structure that is like uh, everybody thinks the same way? Like most political movements, they are not, but they're unified. Uh, there is a moderate part, there is a pragmatic part, and there is a more extreme part, that's for sure. When we had national unity government, it was the moderates that prevailed. When we have division, it's the extremists that are prevailing. The, what worries me most is not just Hamas position. I go around, and meet Palestinians in the diaspora. And the question that everybody asks, why do you keep talking about two-state solution? And people are reasonable. They look at the maps, they look at the settlements, they look at this world, and they say, what are you talking about? So my worry here, I mean, and that's a worry that should concern everybody. We still struggle for two-state solution, but my message to you, we've reached a crucial point. We don't have the time to wait for what will happen in the next elections, and then the elections after, and then the elections after. You can afford that in the United States. But there in the region, you cannot. And simply, my worry is, if more time passes, and this continuous policy continues, we could see the elimination of the possibility of two-state two solution. That is not a theoretical matter. That is a real threat on the ground, and it will have terrible, terrible consequences, part of which what you've spoken about, the possibility of re-rise of Palestinian national movement in a completely different way, because the existing authority has lost its ground, and the failure of Annapolis process would be the last point. Believe me. That's very stark. Okay. Um, in the back, the lady with the Hi, I'm Cynthia Roller. I'm just an attorney in town, and I've, um, I've done a lot of events over at the Jerusalem Forum. And it, it just strikes me that, that I'm wondering how you're going to get both sides honest with each other, because there seems to be so much trading going on with respect to what the objectives really are. And for example, the, the, you know, the Palestinian objective of having a two-state solution, when you go to the Jerusalem Forum, they talk about what they really need is a road that goes from the West Bank to Gaza, which effectively triangulates the north and the south of Israel to you know, create sort of a, launch, a military launching pad to, to you know, isolate the south from the north. And th that's not something that you ever hear as, as you know, an overt objective, but it's, it's a subtextual objective. And there are other subtextual objectives Right. So, so the question is, how okay. do we get them together, given all of the, the complexity? I mean, neither side is honest with each other, because when you get into the, the back door of either one, you hear there, these subtextual agendas that are, that are just um, making peace impossible. So my question is, sort of how do you get, how do you get that, all, the, all the stakeholders together? I mean, we, where I come from, we call it a coming to Jesus meeting. I mean, tell us what you the, the four objectives. That okay, you we, we've, got, we've got actually we've got a very little amount of time. I'm going to collect some other questions. But uh, how do we get that come to Jesus meeting in, right. in Israel Palestine context? So, <laughs> um, right here. Um, is it, well, with respect to the information with the movie, if, what, what can it map? Could you introduce yourself? Excuse me. Could you introduce yourself? I'm sorry, I'm Melvin Lede. I'm representing the Aspen Institute. Um, what can it map? Earlier slides, you see what uh, your counterpart described as the, the continuous degradation or how should I say, occupation of Palestinian lands. Now, taking that within the context of recent push position of, of the recent push of position of there needs to be an independent and continuous Palestinian state, what will be the Israeli response now? And 
in your hopes that the Americans, the Palestinians, and the Israelis, and the uncertain things that you can maintain as we move forward in the peace process, what will be the future of the response to that position which has been used in the South South to maintain by future Americans? What happens is the current position of the issue is saying that the peace process will go one more survey. If we're really, in, uh, Jim, Fine, Jim Fine, Friends Committee on National Legislation, if we're really interested in achieving an Israeli-Palestinian peace, how much attention should we be paying to the U.S.-Iran relationship and to the threats and rumors of the It's the U.S.-Iran. Great, somebody finally asked a question. All right. <laughs> so, um, all three of you to just repeat, how are we going to get that uh, come to Jesus' meeting? How are we going to get um, all the subjects, questions uh, into the room? Um, uh, what will be, uh, what happens if the American, the current Bush administration position carries over to the next? Um, and then what do we do about this whole uh, U.S. Iran, Israel Iran question? John? On, on U.S. and Iran, never have I seen a time when the regional environment impinges more negatively on Israeli peace making. The 1970s, from 73 to 91, the breakthroughs that were achieved by America, and only three, Kissinger's disengagement agreement, two Carter's Egyptian Journal Peace Treaty, and first President's father and Jim Baker's efforts to put it together in Madrid. They were all done primarily by America, with tremendous help from the other and the Israelis, who got the process started in this case. The process could be insulated to some degree. That's no longer the case. Um, Hamas's presence is mullahs. Syria and Iran, and the, and the great likelihood that sometime in the next two years there will be a moment of truth, quote unquote, in which Israel will, is, the Israelis may face the possibility of considering unilateral action on their own to stop an enrichment process or a weaponization process that is, is about to cross a threshold or preempt it from crossing a threshold, will create a crisis much broader and larger than anything that could ever be triggered by the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, which I would argue, as important as it is, for the next president, is probably number three or four in the interests that need to be pursued. Extricating ourselves from Iraq in a way that's consistent and credible with our interests, finding a way to deal with the Iranians who sit at the nexus of everything we care about in this region, and of course preventing another attack on the continent of the United States, which is the most important objective of all. Those are the three primary interests that we have. The fourth, which is the Arab-Israeli issue, um, needs to be pursued, for sure. Um, so I'm very, very worried about this issue. Some argue it's coming before, between now and the end of the administration. I doubt it. But that moment of crisis will come. Thank you. Gentlemen. I want just to add one point. Uh, I tend to disagree with Aaron on this matter because, uh, of course, Iraq is a very important place and you have so many soldiers there and something has to be done about that place. Uh, the energy crisis, China, etc. But I think, uh, although this might sound uh, something that was said so many times and uh, repeated, uh, one should never under Estimate the effect of the Palestinian question on the whole relationship of the world, not only with Arab countries, with the Muslim world. Uh, I think we have to look at this factor in two perspectives. Either the Palestinian Israeli issue will be a catalyst of improving the situation, or it will be a, catalyst, a catalyzing factor, if I can use that word, or it can be an undermining, it can happen in the undermining effect on any arrangements that are made. But in every aspect, it will have one, force, one, one side or the other. What you will not have with the Israeli-Palestinian situation today is status quo, where it's not important and you can ignore it for four years. That you will not have. It will affect the situation in Lebanon. It will affect the situation in Iraq. It will affect even the situation in Pakistan. And I hope that there is enough wisdom not to underestimate that particular fact. Daniel? Look, I think it, it's, not so, it's not so much whether the current administration's policy continues. 
the, um, the American opposition to settlements is, is a constant, and it hasn't got us very far. I, look, I think much of what goes on today is, is inertia in the system, in terms of settlement expansion. I don't think that, that uh, Edward Olmer and his minions kind of mini me, how shall we make uh, Condoleezza Rice embarrassed in her next visit, let's announce another new neighborhood. I think there are people inside the system for whom that is a goal. And I think you know, someone like uh, Akira Eldar's book on Lords of the Land, which, which details how the settler movement has so integrated itself within the bureaucracy. So I think we're on inertia now. What I'm arguing is there is kind of an either or here. Either in terms of your American position, you try and get a deal on permanent borders. And while I agree with Aaron that, as you defined it, a conflict ending solution is not possible in terms of even the vast majority saying, OK, I have no conflict, I have no claims, I still think a a, a political deal that has sufficient legitimacy on both sides is possible, especially given what Mustafa said about where I also think Hamas are on the two-state solution. So I think either you say, we're going to get permanent borders, we're going to get a deal here, and you better make damn sure that you go into this knowing your chances are high, which is why I think President Clinton going to Camp David without having a serious assessment of what would be a reasonable outcome and then check in with the two folks he was inviting as the interlocutors, whether they were anywhere near close to getting there, was an act of responsibility. And I think launching this Annapolis process on the same base was an act of responsibility. Because if you don't think you can get there, then I think your focus becomes keeping the option alive by working a heck of a lot harder on preventing further deterioration in the ground. It, and, 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 and I think there, there, I don't think it's easy. I think there are still going to be things that slip through. But I think you could get a full court press on the Israeli side in terms of, look, you're not in a peace process now. You don't want that. You've told us you don't want that. Here's how we want to manage the, the, the day to day. I would agree with Mustafa in the following way America will get sucked into this. 20 visits in an administration of a Secretary of State in an administration whose overarching position uh, Aaron describes as the disengager as terms of President Bush. Um, the question is, do you get sucked into it on terms dictated by the region, or do you get sucked into this in terms that you have a significant role in, uh, in dictating yourselves? That, that, I think that's the question for, for, for people here. OK. Um, I'm going to just ask one final question, and it's looking at this context and picking up on, our, on, on what Aaron just said about these priorities for the United States government. Um, generals, what do you, are there synergies to be gained in the Israeli-Palestinian context by dealing with Iraq, Iran, simultaneously with putting aside the question of whether we have a diplomatic capability to actually move simultaneously three fronts? Are there synergies doing a very big regional bargain on here, given that they're all such high priorities? There may be, but the reality, the reality is you've got Americans in harm's way in a very tenuous situation. You've got two presumptive presidents who have come up with different approaches to an active ongoing war in which 130,000 American forces are involved and billions of American dollars. There is no way that Iraq will not become the key focus of the next administration, particularly if it's a President Obama. So I think it's, it's I'm thinking like an American in Washington. I'm not thinking like, you know, we're all obsessed with the Palestinian issue, believing that it will infect, influence, and shape everything. And I, I understand I understand the intensity of power and the ferocity of this, of this issue to influence um, negatively a lot. But I just think that come January of 09, 
The next American president will be focused on two issues. Number one, if it's President Obama, what am I going to do with the campaign commitments and promises that I've made to numerous constituents, who, particularly young constituents, who powered my candidacy? I've got to reconcile them with the realities on the ground. And second, that's the political clock. The urgency will be driven, or could be driven, by the Iran nuclear issue, which will, in fact, be an Israeli problem at some point. The Israeli tail is going to be wagging the American dog on the issue of what to do, excuse me, what to do about Iran. And I, I do not believe, particularly if the Bush administration passes on to its successor, Republican or Democrat, a hard situation, the next president will do precisely what George W. Bush did when he inherited the worst hand of any American president on this issue. They will either walk away from it or they will play at managing it. They would do that anyway. But against these other two issues which are out there and very real for very important constituencies, one, the American electorate, and second, Israel, and Israel's supporters here, these will be the two core issues that will drive our policy. Whether we can do all of this at one time, of course, is another matter. Any final words, gentlemen? Yeah, I'm Dr. Margot, please. I would like to comment on that issue of Iran, Iraq, versus Palestine. <coughs> Uh, I know that uh, the priorities in the case of the American administration will not be decided by the materialistic because of the, how terrible the human rights conditions are in Palestine, or how horrible this war is, and uh, we are realistic. We, we will, I don't think this will be the determining factor. But as I see the relationship is more profound than that, we all know very well that the U.S. policy towards Iran and Iraq has been influenced dramatically by the Israeli influence and by the pro-Israeli lobby here in the United States. The dual containment policy of Iraq and Iran, the invasion of Iraq. So, uh, in my opinion, the relationship about, even about a question like the Iraqi question, is related to us, not directly as Palestinian Israeli, but it relates to how much the United States policy in the Middle East in general is independent relatively or not independent from the Israeli policy. I say that because I have never, I mean, I think I am right. I don't think we have ever witnessed a situation uh, at which the United States policy, not only towards Israeli-Palestinian question, but the American policy towards the Middle East in general has been so influenced by the Israeli position. And in that sense, I think the policy of the United States in Iraq, in Iran, will one way or another, depending on which way it will take, would relate to the relationship between the United States and Israel. Yeah. And by the fact that we are we are the problem of Israel, if you want to put it this way, we'll be also influenced by this relationship. That's the way I see that. The I, I, need, I need just one tiny corrective here. You know, the pro-Israeli community has a powerful voice, but not a veto over American foreign policy. I worked for this administration for Colmbaum for two years. And this you may or may not want to trust me on. I do. This trillion dollar social science experiment that we call Iraq was cooked up. For, they didn't need any help and or support from the state of Israel or the pro-Israeli community. This was brought to you courtesy of an intersection of events. Unfinished business from 1991, the desire to do transformative diplomacy to get at the root causes, the ABC phenomenon, 9-11. And somehow, the big ideas generated from the administration. This was not part of some um, tiny, uh, group of individuals, even with the influence of the neoconservatives within the administration. So I don't think this was uh, an Israeli a policy fashioned by the Israelis. 
or even influenced by the Israelis. And American independence of policy, which we have not exhibited very often on this issue since 1991, is possible. The issue is not whether lobby lobby. The issue is whether presidents in defense of American interests lead. That's the question. And if that, if the next president determines that he is going to lead on this issue, the domestic lobbies angrily, noisily, will follow, as they have followed every single time an American president sought to pursue an independent American policy. So I made it over an independent policy. And a pleasant afternoon. To, 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 to very briefly weigh in on this. Look, I, 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 I would agree. I don't think um, this was certainly not driven out of, out of Israel. Uh, the Iraq policy, uh, in fact, many in the Israeli security defense establishment uh, felt that there was a neighbor of Iraq that kind of merited a little more attention um, at the time as well. I, it, it certainly, I, I think that the, the neoconservative group were, were absolutely front and center in, in, in making this happen, but uh, to the extent to which they have links, some of them, to Israel or to the Jewish community, I don't think that those are the same thing. They are not Israel, and they, they are not part of the Jewish community, or even the, uh, the, the, the so-called Israel. Look, no, I, I would say this, I think it is, it's our responsibility as Israelis and Palestinians. We're not shipping this over to, to America and saying this is all in, in your lap. Uh, Aaron, you said the ceasefire is a road to nowhere uh, regarding Gaza. That may well be the case. My, my position would be, yeah, sure, maybe there'll be lots, lots more bloodshed before we eventually come back round to doing the same things. And by the way, I agree with Mustafa. There is a point at which, and, and I don't think we've crossed it yet, but I also fear that we are dangerously close to it, that doing the same things is no longer an option. It's just the two-state solution will simply not be an option at some stage. My argument would be that maybe you get there in a less bloody way uh, if we get a ceasefire first. I'm not saying it could be locked in, but it could create a positive dynamic of its own, which is why I strongly support the ceasefire package. It's not going to be a ceasefire. I think today the degree of dysfunctionality and the inability to make decisions in the Israeli system and to a significant degree in the Palestinian system. And I think on the Israeli side, it is increasingly structural and a function of our particular brand of impossible to manage or strategically plan coalition electoral politics means that the most likely way there will be through some kind of external push and that would have to be American led. In terms of the region and the Palestine question, and I'm not saying an American administration is capable of juggling this many balls at once, I would argue that it's a necessity to do so, and to certainly try to do so, and I would go back to the logic of the Iraq study group. I, I, I think that chapter two of the Iraq study group is still the best guide to how these issues are interconnected and therefore why if you, if you can't bring, bring in the, the, the overall picture, you're going to have a real problem with Iraq. I think part of, of, of creating the conditions for a responsible redeployment out of Iraq, some of it at least, is the outside in. It's not just going to be what's going on inside Iraq. Once you're in the business of the outside in, it means you, I think, got to try and be working in a different way with all of the neighbors. Once you're trying to do that with Iran, and parenthetically, I would say Syria, that conversation shouldn't just be restricted to Iraq, nor do I think it will be successful if it's just restricted to Iraq. In that sense, I, I, I disagree with the ISG report. Once you're in that kind of a conversation with Iran, I think it would be crazy not to use the opportunity of saying, hey, we want to put on the table your disposition towards the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Likewise with Syria. That creates new opportunities on Israel-Palestine. Can an administration juggle so many balls at once? I think if you're doing Iraq in the only way that can really get you out of there in a responsible way, it creates that opportunity. I would take that opportunity. And the main reason I take that opportunity isn't out of a selfish, or isn't only out of a selfish Israeli-Palestinian interest, but also because if you don't, it will continue to poison everything else. 
and perhaps poison everything else in ways that are sufficient that it will have a prohibitively negative effect on being able to actually achieve the other things uh, that, that, uh, that Aaron rightly, I think, says are going to be the priority of any incoming administration. That's how I would connect the dots. If you don't connect the dots right, just like when you're a little kid and you've got the connect the dots, but you get a big mess on the page. If you do connect the dots right, sometimes a nice picture can emerge. And maybe too optimistic to say <coughs> such a picture can emerge several years down the line in the Middle East, but I, I, I would strongly advocate trying to do that, and I do not think it's an impossibility. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everyone. Aaron.